Well, good morning. Um, very welcome to our service this morning. If you're a guest with us, you are especially welcome. We hope you feel uh, a warm welcome into our service as we gather for worship this morning. Please do stay afterwards for some tea and coffee and treats just out the back. Uh, and just a few announcements for those of us in our congregation as we begin our, our service. Um, you'll hopefully have an announcement sheet with all of the information in it. There's a few things that, that aren't on it. Um, firstly, on Wednesday evening, we will be having prayer first here at eight o'clock, just as usual. So Wednesday evening, prayer first will be happening at 8 p.m. just in our coffee area. Please do join us as we gather to pray as a church for various things in our congregation and then further afield in our community and then in our world. Uh, this Sunday morning, we're starting a new series in Ecclesiastes, a book that some of us will have read, some of us will have avoided, but we're excited to be looking at that book together. And then this Sunday evening, um, this evening, uh, David Johnson is back on to our Romans series, looking, uh, picking up where we left off, going to be looking at Romans chapter 7 this evening. Next week, next Sunday morning, is going to be our PW service where we're going to have the Reverend John Seawright with us. You'll see the announcement there. Uh, our speaker's John Seawright speaking on SAT7, which is the PW Overseas Mission Project this year. Uh, there will be a, a few seats reserved for those people who are members of PW, so please do make use of them. Um, and then finally, uh, it is with sadness that we announce the death of Mrs. Ethel Cousins, um, late of 62 Old and Donald Road. We do extend our sympathies to her family circle, particularly to Wendy, Ed, and Heather this morning, and they would like us to announce that the family home, which is in your announcement sheet, will be open to all from 3 p.m. today to call with them, and we're going to be remembering the family in our prayers a little later in our service. We're here to worship God, and sorry, I forgot to announce the funeral details of that. Sorry, the funeral will take place on Thursday, this Thursday at 12.30 in the church, followed by tea here, and then at Rose Lawn for 2.40. So this Thursday at 12.30 in the church for the funeral of Ethel Cousins. The psalmist uh, tells us this in Psalm 47, sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises, for God is the King of all of the earth, sing praises. That's what we're going to do now as we stand to praise God together, singing two songs, firstly in Christ alone, and then all heal the Lamb. So please do stand as we praise God together.
having sung our praises to God, we're going to continue our worship as we come to him in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, you are our hope. You are our joy. You are our light. You are our strength, and you are our salvation. And so we come this morning in praise of you, because you are the Lamb enthroned on high, seated on your eternal throne with all beneath your, beneath your feet, as you reign victorious, forever glorious. You will forever be our King. And Lord God, this morning we come with our praise as our battle cry, because many of us come this morning amidst battles, battles, battles with grief, battles with worry, battles with confusion. Many here this morning feel weak, feel joyless. Many of us this morning doubt. And so we come to you this morning for strength and for hope, longing for peace in our heavy hearts. Lord, may we this morning be strengthened through our worship of you as you remind us of your greatness, of your majesty, of your victory. Lord God, these things weigh us down because they are consequences of a broken and sinful world. When we look at our lives and when we look at the world around us, we know that our relationships are broken. Our desires are bent towards wrong things. Our world is broken by sin. And so we come this morning confessing that sin and brokenness to you. Lord, we ask that you'd reassure us this morning of your forgiveness through your Son. Remind us of our continued strength given to us as we live in this world by your Holy Spirit. And would you fill us this morning with all that we need as our praise this morning come, becomes our battle cry as we walk from this world into glory. Bless us together in our service this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn to our Bibles this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. Uh, you'll find it in the Bibles in front of you on page 553. And we're going to be reading the first 11 verses. So, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, page 553 of your Pew Bibles. And these are probably words that many of us recognize. Maybe we've tried to read Ecclesiastes and we've got to these verses and we've given up because it's not the most joyful uh, part of the Bible. But it does have a lot to speak to us about the world that surrounds us. So please do follow along. Ecclesiastes chapter 1. It says this, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind and, all, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after Amen. And we thank the Lord for his word to us. And we're excited to unpack that a bit later and in the coming weeks. Boys and girls, we're going to put your video this morning on the screen. Last time we did the video, we were looking at Jacob 
And this morning, we're going to be looking at Jacob's son, Joseph, to a story that many of us probably know fairly well. It involves a, a colorful coat. It involves um, some brothers being quite naughty. So keep your eyes on the screen for the story we're going to look at um, a wee bit later in Light Zone. Chapter 12, Joseph's Mean Brothers and What God Meant to Do. Genesis 37 and 50. We've heard a lot about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but did you know that the longest story in Genesis, and one of the longest stories in the Bible, is actually about Jacob's son, Joseph. When Joseph was a teenager, Jacob made him a special robe. It wasn't a choir robe, there weren't many choirs yet, and it wasn't a bath robe, they didn't take many baths either. It was a robe of many colors. Jacob gave it to Joseph because Joseph was his most favorite son, which quickly made Joseph the least favorite brother. And to make matters worse, Joseph had a dream that one day his mom and dad and brothers would all bow down to him. Some dream, the brothers thought, more like a nightmare. So they ripped apart the fancy robe, threw Joseph in a pit, and sold him into slavery. Later, when Jacob asked his sons where Joseph was, the big brothers showed their father the robe and told a lie about Joseph being devoured by a wild animal. Everything in Joseph's life was about to get worse, but then better, then worse, then better, then worse, over and over, until everything finally got better at the end. First, Joseph served as a slave for an important Egyptian official named Potiphar. That's worse. But Joseph was so good at what he did, and the Lord was blessing him so much, that Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his entire house. That's better. But then Potiphar's wife tried to kiss Joseph. And because he knew better than to kiss another man's wife, she lied about the whole thing and got Joseph thrown in prison. That's worse. But God was with Joseph and gave him the ability to interpret dreams for two other prisoners. One of the men promised to remember Joseph when he was back serving Pharaoh. Better. But the man forgot Joseph worse. But later he remembered, better. By the time he was 30 years old, Joseph was working for Pharaoh himself and on his way to being the second most powerful person in Egypt. Much better. Years later, Joseph's brothers came to Egypt, desperately looking for food. And Joseph was the only person who had any food to give. Sure enough, Joseph's family was bowing down before him, except they didn't know it was him, not right away. And once they found out it was Joseph, their long lost brother, the I thought you were dead son, they were afraid. Surely he would not be nice to them after they'd been so mean. But that's not how Joseph saw things. You meant evil against me, he said, but God meant it for good. That's how God works, not just for Joseph, for all his people. No matter how many pits or prisons we end up in, God is up to something better, much better. So boys and girls, the story of Joseph um, went through lots of ups and downs, lots of bad parts, and, and lots of good parts. And as we look at this new book in Ecclesiastes, our mummies and daddies are going to be seeing the same thing, that in our lives there are some really good times and some really bad times. But in all the ups and downs of Joseph's life, at the end, he said, what they meant for evil, God turned for good. What they meant for evil, God uses for good. And we believe the same thing, that in the ups and downs, of our lives, God is always working for the good of those 
who love him. So that's what you're going to be thinking about in Light Zone today. But let me just pray for you before um, we take our offering, and then you'll go a wee bit later in the service. Lord God, thank you for the story of Joseph, and for all those little stories in the story of Joseph that we often look at, the story of his coat, the story of his uh, interpretation of dreams, the story of him forgiving his brothers. And Lord, we're reminded that many times in our lives we go through ups and downs, we go through good times and bad times, good days and bad days, but in all things you work for the good of those who love you. And so we pray that we would trust that, we would place our hope in that, and bless the boys and girls this morning as they go to Light Zone uh, to cement that truth in their hearts. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're not going to lift our offering, so um, that is what we're doing. Boys and girls, you're not leaving just yet. You're going to leave after the prayer, but for now, our offering is going to be received. You'll hopefully um, have received one of these uh, little sheets in your announcement bulletin outlining the work of FIBA, who are our charity um, mission organization that we're going to be supporting uh, and praying for this month. Uh, FIBA is a charity that uses radio and other audio media to inspire people to follow Jesus, especially in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East, and, and more recently in Ukraine. So we're going to be praying for them as we turn to God to pray for others this morning. Let's pray together. Lord God, there's so much going on in our world, and often we hear negative news stories, and our news feeds uh, fill us with dread and doubt and worry. And yet there's a lot going on in your world that we should be positive about, Stories of people working for your good and your glory throughout the world. And this morning, we particularly pray for the work of FIBA. We thank you for all that they have done in years gone by and the witness that they have been. And this morning, we place them in your hands as they continue their work in Africa and Asia and in the Middle East. Particularly this morning, we pray for uh, FIBA's partner in broadcasting to Tibet and the sur surrounding diaspora. We pray for the work that they're doing, that their message um, would go far and wide, and that people would respond to it. Lord, we give thanks for the work carried out by FIBA in Ukraine in this last year especially in them establishing two new radio stations. Lord, in a war-torn country, things are difficult. And we thank you for the work of FIBA bringing good news 
and bringing joy and peace and rest through their radio messages. And we pray for these two new stations that word of them would carry, that they would grow in people listening, and that your witness would grow in the church in Ukraine. You would grow their numbers through this. Lord, we thank you for the leadership training programs that uh, FIBA's partners have developed in collaboration with the Yemeni Christian leaders. And we pray for those involved in this new initiative that's brought together leaders from a wide range of churches across Yemen to discuss leadership issues and learn from one another. Lord, the church benefits whenever it grows together and learns from one another. And so we thank you for this, for this work that FIBA have been doing. And we pray that you would continue to bless them as they work for your kingdom. Lord, this morning we also pray for the work of the NHS and all health services uh, on this island. Lord, when you walked in this world, you healed all manner of diseases. And today you heal, and you heal through the work of doctors and nurses and dentists and all medical professionals who work in our country. You have blessed them with gifts and with wisdom and knowledge. And yet our health service is uh, facing a lot of strain at the minute with long waiting lists and lack of beds. It's becoming difficult in their circumstances, and many of them are getting uh, worn out. Many of them are finding things difficult, and so we pray that you would encourage them, uplift them, comfort them, and bless them. Bless our health service, and bless those involved in its leadership as they, as they make difficult decisions. Lord, closer to home in our church, we pray for the work of little lambs, we pray for all of the parents and children that come and use that and have been blessed by it. Lord, often motherhood can be lonely and difficult. Days can be long as toddlers throw tantrums and don't nap when they should. Maybe mothers can't get out of the house as much as they once had hoped. And so we thank you for the work of our little lambs. We thank you for the help that we provide and the relationships that we provide for mothers in our community, many of whom maybe don't come to church and don't have a church connection, but feel the warmth of your presence through the relationships that they have in little lambs. So we pray that you would continue to work through it. Bless the leaders. Bless all those involved in it. And we pray that many new connections between uh, those mothers and our church would be made in the weeks ahead. And Lord, finally, we pray for the family of Ethel Cousins, particularly Wendy, Ed, and Heather. We pray for them in the week ahead as they prepare for the funeral on Thursday. We pray for peace and comfort as they grieve and we pray for them in the weeks ahead as they adjust back to normality. We pray that you would help them in their grief, that they would be reminded that you are our rock and refuge, our ever-present help in times of trouble. We pray that you would bless them and comfort them and give them rest in these days and weeks ahead. And we ask this all through Jesus' name. Amen. Before William comes to preach to us from the book of Ecclesiastes, we're going to sing once more. So please do stand if you're able as we sing, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God.
just to, uh, am I turned on? Yeah. Just to remind you, we're going to have prayer first on Wednesday. Uh, Stephen mentioned it there. It's out of sync a little bit. It's usually the first Wednesday night in the month, but last week was Easter. So we give you a week off. So uh, we come back this Wednesday night. So I commend that to you. And also, uh, by way of congratulations to Ben. Ben uh, got accepted for uh, the, to be trained for the ministry of our denomination, our church in PCI. So congratulations to Ben. Oh, there he's down there. I couldn't see him there, but he is there. So you can congratulate him or commiserate with him later on, <laughs> whatever you feel is appropriate uh, later on. So well done. Let's just pray before we look at uh, this uh, book of Ecclesiastes. Let's just. Father, we thank you for another day. We can come uh, after Easter. We know that last week we celebrated your resurrection and you're alive. We were singing about it today again. Uh, we know that you are alive, and that means that you're here with us. And we can't understand your word without you, without your Spirit's input. And so we ask, Lord, that by your Spirit you would speak to us, that our hearts would be open, that our eyes would be all seeing, our ears would be all hearing, and that we would fully understand what you might be saying to us today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. We're going to go through it, through it the next number of weeks. Um, I'm not sure what you think of the book of Ecclesiastes. It just seems all gloom and doom. But let's see if we can see some positive things out of it. Whenever you go to college, um, you learn a lot of theory. Or university, you learn all this theory. You get lecture after lecture. It gives you theory. And when you're sitting in theological college, you think, when are we ever going to get to the practice? When are we ever going to get out there and get on with it? And sometimes we think when we're learning all the theory, theory is it really that effective? Is it really all that much use? But unless you learn the theory, the practice will not follow. And yet at the same time, you can't do the practice well without the theory. So the two work together. However, in the classroom or in the college, you get the ideals. This is the way it ought to be, or this is the way it could be, or this is the way it should be, the ideals. And when you get out into the real world, you realize that back in college when they taught you the ideals, that in practice, the ideals don't always work out. And I think this is something like what Ecclesiastes is saying. That the real world is where we live, and the ideals we have don't always show themselves up to be ideals. Ecclesiastes, if you want one way to put it, it's about living in the real world. Living in the real world. And it tries to get us to think. Think about your setting. Think about where you're at. Why you're here in this world. Why you're here in this particular context. What's going on in your life. Because everything in our world is really messy and often the theory, as positive as it may well be, life doesn't always smile on us. All things don't shine all the time. And so reality can be quite difficult. T.S. Eliot once said, humankind can't bear too much reality. If we stick with the theory, we'll have rose-tinted glasses. But reality takes those glasses to a different level. One of the things about this book, which is often overlooked, there are two people involved. In verse 1, you've got a narrator, and the narrator signs off at, the, at verse 1, and then he turns up again at chapter 12, verse 9. And so he says, these are the words of the preacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. And then you have from verse 2 down to Chapter 12, verse 9, a sermon, a long sermon, all in the ensuing chapters in between. And so the narrator, in one sense, um, and the, the teacher here, um, which is the, the, who gives the sermon, the teacher and the narrator, they aren't necessarily on the same page. They're not far apart in one sense, but not necessarily exactly on the same page. So, for example, um, the 
teacher, the preacher here in the book can come across very negative. And when you get to chapter 12, right at the end, um, the, the narrator is saying, look, this preacher was looking for something in life and didn't exactly find it. And so he tries to point us away to something else. And the narrator in different places, he, at, at the end of the chapter, rather, he takes a little shot at the teacher and he said, look, he didn't find what he was looking for. And he puts all this material together for his son to discipline or to um, disciple his son, his children. And he said, this preacher didn't find all he was looking for, but let me tell you how you can find what you're looking for. Now, he wasn't always negative, the preacher. Chapter 4, verse 6, he says, better a handful of, or better a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil. So he has little gems, little pointers in between. So, verse 2, you get this sermon. He starts off with vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Aren't you glad you came to church today? It's all so depressing, isn't it? All is vanity. It all looks gloom and doom. The, the word in there is hebel, H-E-B-E-L, hebel. And what it means is breath, or vapor, or breeze. And the preacher is saying, life is nothing but a puff of wind, a breath, a mist, a puff of smoke. You're here one moment, and then we're gone. And so the teacher preacher here is saying, life is short. And that's my first point. Life is short. James in the New Testament also says the same things. He asked the question in James chapter 4, <clears throat> what's your life? He said, your life is nothing but a vapor. Here one minute, then gone forever. I think I've said this before. I'm not sure what your favorite crime programs in is it, uh, are. It might be prayer, Pryro, or it might be Miss Marple, it may be Columbo, it might be a whole pile of other things, but Columbo is one of my favorite ones. And the way it's all set up is that you get the crime at the beginning, and you know who's done it. And then this little man in this white coat comes along and one eye half open, one eye closed. And he, and he pieces everything together and until he gets his man or his woman or who's ever done it. And Ecclesiastes is like that. It loads the story up at the front. It says, it's all bad news. It's all vanity. It's all gloom and doom. And so then you try to piece the story together as you go through the book. And by the way, um, a Dundonald, a, a, a guy who some of you went to school with here uh, from Dundonald, David Gibson, Reverend David Gibson, he's over in Aberdeenshire in Scotland, has written a commentary. It's, not, it's only relatively recently uh, produced, and it's a very good one. I commend it to you, David Gibson um, on, on Ecclesiastes. But anyway, our first point here this morning is life is short, isn't it? Isn't life short? It's very short. Whenever we were all young, which was one time, whenever we were all young, we used to hear older people say, doesn't life fly? Life is short. I remember people saying this when I was young, and, and I used to think to myself, well, I'm young. You know, I don't have to worry about that now. Once I was 16. Now it's the other way around. I'm Come on, 61. Once you were 17, now you're the other way around. It's 71. Or once you were 18, now you're maybe 81. So if you take 17 to 71, it's 54 years in between. Where did they go? Fast and furious. We come and we go. We're born. We live a little while. And then we die. As I said at the beginning, weren't you really glad you came to church this morning? Really encouraging stuff. But it's true, isn't it? Nothing lasts. The kettle burns out. You need another new kettle. The good morning, you need to be in a hurry to go somewhere. You can't get your coffee or your tea. The toaster, some other morning breaks down. The washing machine breaks down. The car, the mechanic tells you, you know, it's so many years old, you're going to have to spend a fortune on it. You might as well get rid of it and get a new. It doesn't last. Nothing lasts. Neither do we. 
Proverbs 31 verse 30 says, Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. Hebo, the same word for fleeting as vanity. Or in the, in the words of Joan Collins, when she said one time, the problem with beauty is that it's like being born rich and then ending up poor. It just, the beauty just blows away with the wind. Ecclesiastes is one of a, a number of books known as the wisdom books or the wisdom literature. So Job is another one. Job teaches us how to suffer well. And then you have the Song of Solomon that teaches us how to love well or how to do marriage well. And here you've got Ecclesiastes basically telling us how to live well, how to do life well. It's wisdom that enables us to do life well. And wisdom is a gift of God. It comes from God. And when you have this wisdom, there's a, there's a calm that comes into your heart and into your life and into your soul, into your persona. The circumstances may fall down around you. Circumstances will change. But when you've got the wisdom of God, through the grace of God, through the gospel of God, by coming to Jesus Christ through faith in God, in Jesus Christ, you have this wisdom that puts you on a higher plane. It, it teaches us to where to go for green pastures, Psalm 23, rather than going to McDonald's and all that not so great food. You go to better pastures. Junk food isn't always good for us. Wisdom teaches us that, and wisdom teaches us we need to exercise. Wisdom teaches us a lot of things. But what wisdom teaches us, it teaches us where to find the good paths, the good pastures, the great pastures. And you let them in, enter your heart and steer you in the direction you ought to go. And when we enter this relationship with our maker, G Jesus Christ, the creator of the world, there's a way to live in this broken world that gives us perspective and hope and takes us above the tedium of everyday life. And we need, just stick with this idea for a moment that life is short. And there's a reason why life is short. I'm not sure if you know what the reason is, but many of us do. Way back in the beginning of this world, when God made this world and created you and me, he, he set parameters. And he said, look, here's what you would do in the garden. And Adam and Eve came and they, they ignored God's wisdom and they applied their own wisdom and they went beyond what God told them what, how to live. And so once they went beyond that, God says, well, look, you're on your own and life's going to be short. You're going to die because they sinned right at the start. And so they ignored the wisdom of God. We applied their own wisdom and they became Mr. and Mrs. Independent. I want to do life my way. I'm going to be the boss of my own soul, the master of my own fate. And God says, well, if you want to do it that way, well, then life's going to be short. And death entered the world. And that's the consequences of what Adam and Eve did. We, we are unfortunately, are the recipients of it. We'll all die. We were created from the dust of the earth, and to the dust we will return. Life is short. Psalm 90 reminds us of that. You know, it talks about the grass growing up in the morning and then up comes the sun and it withers and dies and passes away. And the years that we're being allotted is three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength, they may be four score years. You take a walk through any graveyard and you look at the tombstones and do the mass. You will find you a 10-year-old or a 20-year-old or a 30-year-old. You'll find an 80-year-old and a 90-year-old, but do the mass. It'll come where somewhere close to three score years and ten. Life is short. Or you go to James 4. He says, life's just like a vapor, a mist. Try to catch a vapor. You know, try to you know, boil the kettle and try to get a bottle and put the steam into a kettle or into a time capsule. Put it in a time capsule and store it up. Here's the 7th of April. Stick it in a wall somewhere and plaster it up and you leave it for a future generation to find it. Oh, here's mist, vapor from 2024, 7th of April. See what you think of it. 
No. Life's short. We're but a breath, a mist, a puff of wind. Blew out the candle, and the, the smoke goes up for a moment, and then it's gone forever. Whenever I was at school, it's in two floors, I think. I can't remember a third one. And we used to live up on the second floor. I always tried to get a seat at the window. And I could look out over the countryside. It was quite high up. Rathfrey Island on the hill. It's high. And you could look out towards Newry and see the countryside. And I loved just getting at the window. Why did I like getting at the window? I wanted to deflect anything from the teacher, from the class, from the subject. And if I could see something move outside, it took up my attention. Deflection. I had my own ideas, my old plans, my own thoughts about school. It's not that I hated school, but I didn't like it. <laughs> I thought I knew better. But we all build deflections into our lives. You know, when we get depressed, do you go shopping? Shopping miles are deflectors. Or the internet, we surf there. Or some aspiration about relationships or certain goals and aspirations that we have. We always think we know everything, how it works. So you go out for a walk or go to the shop or go to visit somebody and it's raining. You, how do you always go without your umbrella? Or you're in the shopping mall, you're doing your shopping in Asda or Tesco or wherever. And you, you see the queues, and so you go to what you think is the shortest queue, and all, this queue, all the queues all around you seem to go quicker than yours. Or sometimes you're just down on it, depressed. or you, you No reason to be down on it, but you just can't put your finger on it. Or you put your whole life and soul into something other than to realize, you know, this is not what I really joined up for. Or you land the perfect job. And the company that you're working for just goes bankrupt. Or you manage to save up a deposit to buy a house and the interest rates go sky high and you can't afford the mortgage. Why are the young often taken? We try to deflect from thinking and from working it out. Life is short. In preparation for this, whenever we decided to do Ecclesiastes, I read the first chapter, and I got to verse 11, and I, it, it jumped out at me. There's no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after us. And I thought, what a verse. This is really depressing. You know, nobody's going to remember us. Do you remember your grandparents? My grandparents on my father's side were dead before I was gone. I never met them. Both of them died within 15 months. Both of them had cancer in their 60s. On my mum's side, my grandfather died when he was 62. I was four. And so the, the deepest memory I have is of one grandmother. She died when she was 87. But can I remember my great-grandparents? Do you even know their names? What they did? Where they lived? Where they're from? What about you? How far can we go back? How far can we remember? You know, we can build our lives on our own identity. We can become top dog in our job, chief of staff, manager, master, major, and then we retire. See, the minute we retire and walk out the door, they just get on with the job the next day as if we'd never been there. About a year ago, I was invited back to Donegal to the school where I was chairperson. And when I was there in Donegal, there was a steep learning curve straight out of college, straight into a new church, straight into chairman of a school. I hadn't a clue how to learn everything. And they'd have, we eventually... School was growing at a huge rate. It was the fastest growing town in Europe. And every class was doubled in a short period of time. We needed a new school. I oversaw the new school. The new school was built at, I don't know, many million. Fantastic space. 
and the principal retired last year, so I go back up, Karen and I, and I knew about four teachers, and I knew about a dozen parents, and the board had completely changed, as if I was never there. It didn't matter to me, but I thought, everything's moved on. It's a better school now without me, obviously. But, but nobody remembers us. We're here one day and we're gone the next. It's like building sandcastles on the beach. You've all done it. Build a lovely sandcastle with our children or done it yourself or your grandchildren. In comes the tide. It's gone. Life is short. Secondly, verses 5 to 7, life is samey. Silly word, but trying to get them to rhyme. Um, the things in life are just the same. So verses 5 to 7, he gives three illustrations in there from nature, the sun, the wind, and streams. And what do we say about history? History repeats itself. Verse 5, it says, well, just look at the sun. What does the sun do? It rises every morning, sets every evening, goes round and round and round in this circuit. And it's like a magnetic ball that never reaches its destination. It never changes direction. It never goes on holiday. It never takes a break. On and on it goes. Every morning it turns up and every evening it sets down. Same thing day in and day out. He can't make sense of it. Then verse 6, he said, just look at the wind. Where does it come from? Well, where does it go? With plenty of wind yesterday, hadn't we? And some this morning. And you know, does it ever reach its destination, the wind? Well, what's the meaning of it? Where does it come from? Where does it go? There doesn't seem to be any reason to it. Even the, the forecasters can't work it all out. Verse 7, then the streams. They flow into the sea, and yet the sea is never full. Where I grew up, we'll look out at Sleeve Muck, where the, the source of the river Ban is, and right behind us, the Sleeve Crew, where the source of the Lagan is. Look at them every other day. And they flow into rivers, and the streams are all around us, up at home everywhere. They flow into the ban or the lagon, and they come out here, and they go up into cool rain and out into the sea, and the sea's never full. It's full of water all the time. It's like a huge big bath with, with, a, with no plug or with a plug, and it's just, where does it all go? Evaporation, a trillion gallons a day, up and down, up and down it goes. No end. Recycling on a large scale. Doesn't the New Testament teach us, Romans, that we're learned from nature? That, that, that they're, they're meant to be mirrors to reflect God? We can see in nature that there's somebody behind all of this stuff. And here's this writer here, this preacher, this speaker, the teacher. He said, well, I, I just don't understand it. What's it all about? Things are the same. You know, things keep going around. The sun keeps turning up. Repetition. So we go to the same job every day. We go to bed at night. We get up in the morning. We have toast and tea and porridge and go to work, come home, have a bit of food, go to bed, get up the next morning, go to work, same thing. Repetitions, the same. Maybe we change jobs, but we still do the same thing. You get up in the morning, go to work, and come home again. Or we move houses to stop the repetition, or we maybe get new gadgets to make things slightly different, to change the boredom. And the thing here is this teacher seems to become just weary even thinking about it, verse 8. It just wears him down and depresses him. But then the second part of verse, verse, he hits it on the head. He says, I has never seen enough of seeing, nor has ear got us full of hearing. In other words, I've got this appetite just for more of the same stuff. What I had yesterday, I need more of it today and tomorrow and the next day. You get the iPhone, I don't know what iPhone mine is, I, I, know, I have iPhone something and the newest ones come out, you, you need the newer one. Or you go to one party and then you have to go to another one. Or you, you just want something the same that may be slightly different. Sometimes what we do is we blame our circumstances. You know, if the government had better policies, yeah, well, things would be better, wouldn't they? 
It's like a workman blaming his tools. It's always the circumstances. If we had promotion, you know, things would be better. If I just was a, a little bit higher up the ladder, ladder. If I'd better pay, well, then things would be better at home. I could work a little bit better. If there were better working environments, then things would just be more cushier. But would it? Really? Charles Swindle sums it up this way. He says, The itch for things, the lust for more, so brilliantly injected by those who peddle them, is the virus that drains our very souls of contentment. Have you noticed? A man never earns enough. A woman is never beautiful enough. Clothes are never fashionable enough. Cars are never nice enough. Gadgets are never modern enough. Houses are never furnished enough. Food is never fancy enough. Life is never full enough. You get the picture, don't you? A lot of things are just the same. You get your hair cut. One month, you have to go back. Next month, you get it cut again. You cut the grass in your lawn. You have to cut it next week again. You put the bin out every Monday. You have to put it back out again the following Monday. Pay the bills. Standing orders help. But you still know how to pay the bills each month. Life is short. Life is semi. Lastly, does life really satisfy? Verses 8 and 9. Does it satisfy? We make all these advances today. I remember I stayed with my grandmother quite a bit. I was the eldest grandchild. She had nine children. And in the scullery, they called it, the old kitchen. And um, she had a big bathtub with all the clothes. And she had to put them into the, this big bathtub. And you brought it out, she brought them out and put it through a mangle. Any remember the mangle? Well, you do remember the mangle. And then came in the washing machine. Made it a little bit easier. But you still had to wash the clothes. It was a real blessing to have a washing machine. Dishwashers, cars, things we take for granted. Are we any happier? Do we have any more time than our grandparents or foreparents had? We build roads to alleviate the traffic, and then we need to build more roads to alleviate the traffic that gets stuck at the end of that road. We have a better health system, but have we got more bureaucratic, bureaucratic red tape? And in verse 9, he, Mr. Preacher, he says, he says, there's nothing new under the sun. We come up with something new, but somebody else thought of it long before we invented it. He's not saying there's nothing new. Of course, Mr. Fleming made penicillin. Where would we be without it? Where would we be without technology today? We'd simply be hunters and gatherers if we didn't have something new in technology. Where would we be without travel and surgery and doctors and nurses and teachers? What he means is that we're never satisfied with what we've achieved. We just want more. And so we put man in the moon. One giant step for mankind. Really? We reach the moon, and then you, you want to go to Jupiter or Mars, and then we want to go to the galaxies. How do we conclude all of this? If you take the phrase which is mentioned many times in this book, life under the sun, what it means is there's life for this time, life for here and now, life for you and me. This life of mine, it's short, a lot of things are samey. Does it really satisfy? It's referring to life in the here and now as opposed to the there and then. It's a way of saying, as long as life lasts, this is the way things will be. We are but a moment, and then we're gone forever. Or as Robbie Burns' poem, I, I often quote, it goes like this, but pleasures are like poppies spread. You see the flower, its bloom is shed. Or like snow that falls in the river, a moment white and gone forever. And what he wants us to grasp here, what the writer of Ecclesiastes really wants us to grasp here is that he wants death to sink in. One day it will come to us all. Who knows when it will come? But it will come unless the Lord returns. And he's saying, seize the moment. 
and live. Live now. Because in eternity, you're going to be there for billions of years. And it's what you do with the Creator now that determines where you spend eternity. And David Gibson, in his commentary, says, the answer comes slowly through Ecclesiastes. It's accumulative. It's like an art, artist painting a canvas. And bit by bit, he adds to it. And the writer here paints the picture as he goes along. And so the first part of this is accepting death. That's wisdom. Because what we do is we deflect. We, we don't want to accept it. You know, in the Victorian era, they talk all about death, not about sex. Today, they talk plenty about sex and not about death. We want to be masters of our own fate, but we aren't. We're not God. We're not control. We're not infinite. We're finite. And just imagine for a moment as we conclude. Imagine whatever your position in life. So you get the promotion. Or me as minister, so it'd be great if we had 100% increase in membership of this church over the next five years, three years, two years. Wouldn't that be great? It'd be great if we discipled our children to grow up and know and trust the Lord, leave a legacy of some sort. Imagine if we just change job, move house, would we be any more content? Maybe move away to Spain where there's no rain. That would be better than all the rain we're getting. Or maybe you're single, you want married. Or maybe you're married, you wish you were divorced. Would you be any more content? More money in the bank? If we hadn't the endless cycle of getting up in the morning, getting the kids out to school, coming, rushing home, sorting out the kids, the cycle of running to activities all the time, washing, cooking, sleeping. We want to end the cycle of monotony. Just change it some way, alter it some way. If we only could do it some way, then we get satisfaction. But, you know, there's some comfort, too, in the cycle, isn't it? You know, if you can't sleep all night and you know the sun's going to rise in the morning, that's a good thing. It's not all bad. It's good to know that there are certain rhythms. You know, it's spring follows winter, that morning follows night. Meaning, satisfaction, happiness, what he's saying is not found in novelty. It's found in life beyond the sun, not under the sun. If you come into my house or into the manse and uh, the washing machine was going, it was making an awful rattle. And, and, you, and, you, and you sort of think, you said to me, what, what's all the rattle? I said, well, I don't know. I said, I put all the dishes, uh, you know, Sunday dishes, I just stuck them in the, that machine there. And he said, but that's a washing machine. Said, yeah, but sure, it washes glasses, doesn't it? No, it's for washing clothes. You see, the washing machine is designed and created by its creator to wash clothes. A dishwasher is designed and created to wash dishes. Two different functions, two different designs, two different makers for two different purposes. You have been designed and created and made by God for a purpose. And your purpose needs to be lined up with Him. And it's only lined up to Him and with Him when you come to faith in Jesus. And I go to Augustine for this. Augustine said, You have been made, you, you've been made, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until we find a rest in you. Human reality is characterized by ongoing dissatisfaction within our soul that only God can fill. Only the Lord can do this. And key to this chapter is verse 3. He says, what can a man gain from his labors? What can he gain from all his toils? And the word gain in there is used eight times in Ecclesiastes. And so, so when it's all said and done, you've got all your earnings in for the month, you're all your salaries in, and you've all your bills out, What's left? What's the gain? What's the plus? What's the profit? You're, the profit is you're either living for yourself with life under the sun, or 
you're living for God and Jesus Christ, for life beyond the sun, and you get the life under the sun thrown in. So where will you be? Where will you be a hundred million years from now? Where will you be? Will you be around the throne with God and the Lamb? Or are you just playing around with diversions, looking out the window, with life under the sun? Is Jesus your highest priority or is something else? Why not get your house in order today? Don't sit in the fence with this stuff. Don't gaze at life under the sun. There's far more. And Jesus is the way you get it. And he said, come unto me, all here are weak and heavy laden, and you'll find rest in me. Not under the sun, but with God and beyond what you can see. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the lives that you give to us. They're a gift from you. And the wisest thing that we can do is buy into your wisdom and not into our own. And give ourselves afresh. If we've been walking away from you, come back to you and say, not my will, but yours be done. And maybe we haven't given ourselves at all to you. And you've been far from our minds and far from our hearts, and yet we've been taken of your capital, breathing in the air you give to us enjoying the bodies that we have, the families that we enjoy. They're all gifts from you. And we've been gleaming of your capital. Forgive us. Lord, we want to give our hearts back. We want to give our lives all to you because you give yourself all to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing our final hymn, and uh, if you're here for the first time, I'd uh, love to see you afterwards in the lounge. There's cups of tea and coffee going. Uh, please stay. Uh, we're singing our final hymn. The words will come up on the screen. We are one. Sister, let us wipe your tears.
So now may your grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest, abide, and remain with us this day and then forevermore. Amen.